Welcome to the Up Level Dairy Podcast. This is the podcast for dairy owners, managers, and their trusted advisors who are looking to take themselves and their businesses to their next level of performance, resilience, and success in the dairy farming business. I'm your host, Peggy Coffeen, and it's my mission to bring you the stories and thought leaders to help take you to your next up level. Thanks for joining us for the Up Level Dairy Podcast today. And hey, I have something to tell you. We are doing a fun giveaway from Up Level Dairy right now during this month of April. So head on over to upleveldairy.com, subscribe to receive our emails, and you will be eligible to be in the running to receive this awesome gift box from Up Level Dairy. And what's inside? A few things that dairy managers and any of us in this industry are going to love. It includes a little bit of Up Level Dairy swag, a pair of waterproof bibs from 4D, and also a leadership book recommended in Jay's Book Club from Bridgeforth LLP. So in today's podcast, we welcome a young dairyman with so much energy, and his name is Reese Burnett. So two-thirds of the 9,000 cows in Wyoming are milked on a 110-stall rotary at Burnett Dairy, located just an hour from Greeley, Colorado. Owned by the Burnett family, this dairy has scaled and added new technologies to gain a competitive edge, and that adds to the excitement for a young dairyman like Reese. Reese graduated from Kansas State University and has returned home to the dairy with his wife in 2021. Today, we'll hear from Reese about what brought him back here and his excitement to be a dairyman at Burnett Dairy. This episode is brought to you by Dairy Specialist. Dairy Specialist is one of the leading and most innovative commercial dairy service and equipment dealerships in the country, supplying commercial dairy farms with innovative parlor designs, new construction, remodels, robotic milkers, dairy waste management, and 24-7 support and technical services. Their mission is to be the trusted and dependable advisors that dairy producers can count on to help bring their operational goals and vision to life. Find contact information in our show notes. Well, thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, and so Reese, to get started, just tell us a little bit about your role at Burnett Dairy and a little bit about the dairy itself, too. Yeah, so um, a little history about the dairy. Uh, our family's a little bit unique in that um, my mom and dad and uncle, they didn't grow up as dairy farmers. So first generation, um, you know, my grandparents had a small cow-calf operation and some dryland wheat. And mom and dad knew that wasn't going to be big enough for our family. So uh, they got home from college and they were growing sugar beets and were custom feeding cattle, renting some small feedlots around. And then early 2000s, mad cow disease hit and they uh, had a hard time finding customers for their feedlot. So that's what really pushed them into the dairy business. So they started by renting a neighboring dairy. Um, They milked a couple hundred head there in 2004. And then in 2005, we opened up the dairy where we're at now. Um, so we milked 3,000 cows and a double 35 parallel for 14 years. And then 2019, we uh, built the 110 stall rotary that has a 3,600 head cross vent alongside it and moved all the cows over to that and shut down the old parallel. And uh, yeah, so we're milking just shy of 6,200 head in that facility now. Wow, Reese, thank you for giving us that background. What an interesting story of how Burnett Dairy came to be. I'd say a little bit non-traditional in some ways. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, and so, okay, so uh, 2019, you said, was when the the expansion occurred. You were a college student, right, at K-State? Yep. And now you're back. So what does your day-to-day look like? What are your responsibilities at the dairy? Um, yeah, so that's something that's always changing a little bit. Um, I think that's just part of being a young owner. When I first started back a little over a year ago, my responsibilities were 100% cow-based. And, um, you know, now, a little over a year into it, I share quite a bit of the employee management with our manager and help him to lead that team. Um, you know, I'm very fortunate. I don't know that free reign is really the right word, but my mom and dad and uncle have given me a lot of freedom in my work and uh, have really allowed me to take off and do some fun things with our dairy. Yeah. What's a, any examples you can share of some things that you've been able to spearhead since you've been back? Oh, yeah. Um, you know, my dad always laughs about this one. So we, uh, when I first got home, we were milking all the cows 3X. 
And so 6,000 cows, three times a day is 18,000 milkings. And that was just too much to push through that barn. And so we were running behind on the deck and, you know, we're getting three or four hours behind. And my uncle and I had this idea. I said, well, let's milk some of the cows too, X. And we'll milk a couple hundred head more total. And uh, we won't lose any milk and we'll have fewer overall milkings. So we called my dad up and he said, we got it figured out, dad. We're going to milk more cows. And <laughs> we laugh about that yet. But we've been doing that. We really love that hybrid setup. Yeah. So. So, so you found a way to make that work in your system. And that was that was an idea that that you generated. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. What a great example. Uh, and, you know, I want to spend just a minute, Reese, laying out what makes your geographic location of your dairy really unique because you're not exactly in a top 10 dairy state in Wyoming, right? <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> so, uh, so just speak for a moment about what some of the opportunities and also challenges are of being in a, you know, 6,200 cow dairy in Wyoming. I honestly love milking cows where we do. Um, there's not very many neighbors, and the neighbors that we do have are just absolute top-notch people. Um, you know, our distance from town can be a little challenging at times. We have to provide all of the employee housing because of that. Oh, and how far from town are you from, like, the nearest residential town? So Carpenter is only five minutes, but it only has 96 people that live in that. Oh. So... <laughs> Um, Cheyenne is where we buy all of our groceries and, uh, it's about an hour. You can get there a little quicker if you need to. So what else do you run into being one of Wyoming's, uh, one of Wyoming's dairy farms? Yeah. Well, the weather, you know, that's, uh, something that we, it, it can be good and it can be bad. Right. So the summers, they rarely get above 95 degrees and really dry. So it's perfect milking conditions during the summer. Um, a little bit dry for growing crops. Everything we grow has to be irrigated. But on that same hand, the winters can be pretty brutal. Uh, like I know this last December, Cheyenne set a record. Um, they dropped 40 degrees in 30 minutes. Whoa! <laughs> yeah. It was a pretty nasty storm. Uh, yeah, so that's definitely, well, like you said, it can be an opportunity in the summertime, but a challenge in the in the wintertime. Yeah, it has to be managed for sure. Yeah, yeah. What else do you run into being in your unique geographic location as a large dairy? Um, you know, we have to hold a little bit more milk storage on farm. So, um, so just, what does that look like? Well, so we have a uh, three thirty thousand gallon silos, so about thirty get thirty hours of storage worth. Oh wow! Yeah, but yeah, and then um, you know, if the rotary breaks down, it's usually about an hour before someone can get to us. So we got to be uh, fairly experienced in self-diagnosing issues yeah yeah who's helped you with that that's a big task to take on yeah no it's been good um my dad and uncle are both pretty savvy in that and the guys at dairy Spe at dairy specialists our equipment dealer are uh, very helpful in teaching me a lot of those things yeah yeah so that's really enabled you just having that support to be able to operate a large dairy that is unique in size and scale in a place where not a lot of other dairies are located that's right yeah yeah okay so so reese this is something that's been on my mind since we first started chatting uh, so i mean clearly you're young and sharp and ambitious and i can tell you got a lot of energy um so but let's face it, like you could have gone into the dairy industry and probably picked your job, right? Like, and you could have been, you know, having your weekends off, working shorter days. Uh, there's, there's a lot of competition for young, ambitious talent like you, but right. you, you chose to come back to the dairy. Why? Uh, you know, if there's going to be one audience who understands it, it'll be the audience of this podcast, I'm sure. But it's, uh, it's really just a lifestyle. You know, all, all my favorite memories of, as a kid have came from working with my dad during the summer or, uh, you know, moving cows on horseback with my family on weekends. And that really made me the man that I am today. And so my wife and I have just always known that we want to provide our kids with that same opportunity. Oh, and is your wife a dairy farm girl as well? No, she's not. So I met her in college. Um, she's from Southeast Kansas and no dairy background whatsoever. But she's jumped in with her feet running 
and uh, she's been very successful at it. Oh, that's great. Oh, so you must be quite a salesman. If you got this girl from Kansas that uh, had not grown up on a dairy to move to Wyoming and be your sidekick at the farm. So how, how did you, how did you swing that one? <laughs> Boy, that was a, uh, <laughs> I don't know how I did it. I'm still trying to figure that one out. Clearly, Reese, your family is, is a very forward thinking family between your dad and your uncle and even just making this pivot into dairy, which was a space that they didn't have direct experience with. But I think it speaks to, once again, that forward thinking approach. So I'm curious, what were some of the things that they were doing as business owners uh, and as dairymen to make Burnett Dairy, a place that you wanted to come back to, not just because of this nostalgia, not just because of the legacy, but as a viable business for your future. Yeah, Peggy, I think that um, a lot of that comes from, like you said, their forward thinking. Um, they knew that 3,000 cows wasn't going to be sustainable for our family long term. And um, so just the uh, the mindset that we have to keep growing and keep moving forward. And, you know, like stemming from that is the new expansion project that we've done in the last few years. And, uh, you know, just having that mindset that we want to keep growing and want to be an elite dairy producer is really exciting and really attractive to come back to. Yeah. Okay. So what does it take when you say you want to be an elite dairy producer? What is that going to take? Yeah, it takes lots of hard work, lots of hard work and attention to details. And um, you cannot get complacent. My uncle always says that the biggest enemy of great is good. And uh, if we get complacent with being good, then we're going to start moving backwards. And that's not what we want. It sounds, uh, it sounds Reese, like you are surrounded by some very wise uh, mentors within your own family. <laughs> yep. I'm very blessed in that aspect. Yeah. Yeah. And so, okay. So let's take a little swing at, um, at the business side of Burnett Dairy, because for you to come back to the operation and like I said, not just because of legacy, but because you see this as an important piece of your long-term future and for your, your wife too, that, uh, that, you know, she, cause she's not in Kansas anymore. Right. I'm sure she never hears right. that joke. Uh, <laughs> uh, but when you, when you look at that future piece, like, like, what were some of the conversations and actions that your family took um, in order to really set things up or start bringing you into the business, not just as a worker and not just as, you know, working into these roles, but more on that ownership, that long-term bigger picture ownership side? Right. Um, you know, when we were in school, Peggy, you know, all these counselors saying we were coming back to the dairy farm that they say, well, the older generation and the newer generation just have have to have so much communication. That's what they preach. Communication, communication. And, you know, my family never had like a, a sit down meeting. What does that look like? It was more my dad and I'd be riding in the pickup and we'd bring up the conversation and visit about it. And um, yeah, both older and younger generation did a very good job of communicating the both what both of our ideas for the future would be and so but you know probably the bigger piece to me than the communication is there's a little bit of trust that has to take place from both sides right you know um we're kind of my family's in a unique transition right now because i'm the first of the next generation to come back i've got a younger sister who's still in university and then i've got a younger cousin who is still in high school and now I'm bringing back my wife and it's just, there's so many puzzle pieces that are still up in the air. And so it takes some trust that, uh, it takes some trust from my family that I'm willing to stick around, but it also takes some trust from me that in the end, it's all going to work out. And so my dad and I have just, you know, we kind of have this, um, trust in each other that as long as my wife and I take care of the cows, just like they're our own, that in the end, it's going to work out. I know sometimes, you know, I hear from other producers, it's like, oh, they had to go work off somewhere else, or maybe they, they wanted them to go on to school and pursue that degree. You know, were there, are there some prereqs that your dad and uncle are starting to put into place to say, hey, if you really want this, this is what we need to see from you? Uh, yeah, actually, that started back two generations ago. Mm, tell me my more. Grandpa, my grandpa told my dad and uncle that if they want to help getting started, they both have to have four-year degrees. 
And so um, I had that same requirement and then took it a step further that I have to get enough experience at um, another dairy or another farm or whatever it had, whatever, experience working somewhere else. And uh, so, yeah, I always thought that I was going to spend a couple years after college working somewhere else because of that. But, you know, every summer I just took internship after internship and worked at a small dairy during college, during school, worked at the university feedlot a little bit. And, um, yeah, so then come graduation time, we had that conversation and both my dad and uncle felt that we were ready. I felt ready too. So, you know, Reese, you just mentioned, you just mentioned some of your collegiate experiences, right. Of doing these internships and, and having this, you know, this onsite experience between feed yards and dealings of different sizes and things like that. Um, but one of the questions I have for you is, you know, now that you've been out of college, for a little while. Um, what class do you wish you could go back and take that would help you the most and what real life is for you at Burnett Dairy today? Right. Peggy, I don't know that there is one class that can help prepare you to be a dairy manager. <laughs> I thought about that. And, uh, you know, to be a successful dairy manager, you have to be a people manager. You got to be a good mechanic. You got to understand cows. You got to speak a second language on top of all that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the good classes, that's a good place to start. But I think most of the learning comes after graduation. Mm, yeah. So did you take Spanish? Like, are you fluent in Spanish? Um, you know, or did you take any HR type courses when you were in school? Um, I did. I took a couple HR, human resource management classes. Um, I didn't take any Spanish. I picked most of that up um, being back on the farm, actually. Okay. Yeah. I would not recommend people taking HR management classes. I did not too much from that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so it's interesting. So like you've really found your greatest uh, your greatest education. It sounds like in in the doing more than the studying. Yep, a thousand percent. Yeah, oh, it's initiation by fire, right? Like let's take you home, throw you to six thousand cows and fifty people, and, and sink or swim. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no uh okay so uh, reese we we have talked about this forward thinking theme that is common among your family and you know so i know when i ask you this next question it's something that you've probably thought about so i'm curious you're what 20 what 22 23 22, yeah 22 okay 22 years old 10 years from now you're going to be 32 and so when you are in your early 30s what do you want your typical day to look like at the dairy? Yeah, um, I think that, you know, right now I spend very much time in the cows and boots on the ground type stuff. And I think that that's one of our keys to success is that we have ownership on the ground. And so that's something I never want to lose part of, right? I feel like a lot of young managers come back to the farm and say, well, I don't want to do this. I'm too good for this or, you know, X, Y, and Z. But I think that uh, 10 years from now, I want to still be doing some of that as long as probably having some other responsibilities. But I'd still like to get through the cows every day, get through the milk barn every day. So. Yeah. Yeah. So you want to, you look to have your boots on the ground. Um, but uh, how do you think the business management piece could look different for you 10 years from now? Yeah, I think that uh, I think that as I get older and have more experience, my dad and uncle will start, you know, giving me more of that business management of the dairy itself. Um, you know, but I think about that too, and I, I want to be hungry for that. I want to learn more of that stuff. But I think it's arrogant of me to assume that I would do a better job without them. I want them to always be part of it, whether it's uh, I, I mean, I'm sure it won't be to the same degree that it is today. But I always want them there for that sage advice that they have. Yeah. So you really value their input. You value what they bring to the table. And it sounds like, you know, as you alluded to before, that communication and trust has been a, a big piece of your relationship all the way through. And you mm -hmm. want that to continue on. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, okay. So I'm going to push you a little bit, you know, more in this forward thinking tone here when we, when we think about, you know, your, your tenure outlook of wanting to still be boots on the ground and be touching cows and people every single day, but knowing that 
part of stepping into a bigger role at Burnett Dairy is going to be the ownership side of it, right? And the the business side, the decision-making side. Uh, so when you look at those two pieces, management and ownership and the roles that you will have in the future, what skill set do you think you most need to develop to get there? Um, yeah, you know, I think Peggy, probably the the biggest personal area I'll have to develop is a little self-confidence, right? And self-confidence is a thing that it's such a balance. It's such a pendulum, right? Too much self-confidence and I'll be too arrogant to realize my own mistakes and I'll think I don't need my dad and uncle, but um, too little, I won't be able to make any decisions at all on my own, right? And so stepping into that self-confidence role and seeing where I fit and, uh, you know, just knowing that I can do some things is going to be a big key for me. You've been back at the dairy for a good chunk now to really feel out what this is like. Um, what's your advice to other young, you know, young individuals that are doing what you're doing, coming back and realizing like, oh, I'm the youngest person here. I'm now starting to lead people that maybe you tag alongside of when you were, you know, a little kid. Uh, what, what's your advice to others that are doing what you're doing? Um, and how to make that transition. Right. Um, I think probably the biggest key is having patience, right? If you come back from school and think that, hey, I'm the smartest college graduate here, you know, people aren't going to respect you and aren't going to want to listen to your ideas. But if you're patient of, um, if you're patient with your response time and you're respectful of all the years and service that the employees there have put in, then it's going to work out. You know, our team has been very open and accepting of me coming back. And uh, yeah, it just takes time. Yeah. So patience and then going back to, I think what you kind of alluded to before, I can see you have a, a level of humility, right? That just keeps you grounded. And, uh, and that probably goes a long way with the team as well. What makes you excited for your future as a dairyman? Um, yeah, I think about this one a lot. So my great grandfather, he had, um, 60 milk cows. And I think for the time that was probably a decent sized dairy, but I know that he's looking down on, from heaven right now. And is just absolutely amazed that we're milking 800 cows an hour and probably twice as much milk per cow as he had. Wow. Isn't that incredible? It is crazy. Just in a few generations. And so I'm really excited to see the innovations that uh, the industry will come up with in the next 60, 80 years. Yeah. Uh, and so along those same lines, so you're from a generation, Reese, where you grew up probably with a cell phone and a lot of technology that has been a part of your life since you were a little on. And so just speak to a moment about what what level of excitement does technology uh, give you when you look at that that future picture of your dairy? Yeah, man, I could go on and on about the tech in the milk barn. So it's 110 stalls and uh, it only takes five employees to run it, wow. which is fewer milkers than we were running in the double 35. Wow. And um, part of that is we have three, they're called green source robots. They're the same arms that I believe John Deere and GMC do their welding with. Just green source automation taught them how to milk cows. No way. That's so cool. So there's uh, so they're doing all the prep work and all the post tip work is all done by robots. So the only thing a person has to do is load cows onto the deck and attach the units. Wow. Yeah. Do you think that that right there is part of what makes it possible for you to milk 6,000 cows in Wyoming? <laughs> yeah, it, it 100% is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, and speak to the milk market situation where you're at. You know, uh, what, what, what do you, where, do you, where does your milk go and um, what do you see about the long-term future of your milk market in your region? Yeah, so um, we're really pretty situated off well. Um, so all of our milk goes to Leprino Cheese in Greeley, Colorado right now. Um, it's marketed through DFA. And yeah, I think that, D that DFA and Leprino are here to stay. Um, you know, we would like there to be a little bit more opportunity for growth, but that's not what the market's dictating right now. So we're going to uh, look for growth in other 
enterprises for the time being. And what other enterprises are you starting to look into? Oh, we're all over the place, Peggy. Um, B franching, buying more pivots. Um, we're, uh, yeah, we're all over the place. Apartments, hotels, things like that. Yeah, wow. So you guys are really a family of entrepreneurs. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Okay, so here's a question for you then. So uh, knowing that, um, what is your like wild, crazy business that maybe doesn't have anything to do with dairy that you would love to start someday? Because I bet you've been thinking about that. Yeah, I, uh, you know, so it's kind of going back on my previous answers, right, is that there's not a whole lot of opportunity for growth because of the milk market. I think it would be absolutely awesome to come up with my own milk product and process our own milk on the farm. Ooh, cool. Very cool. Yeah. Well, so we'll give you what, uh, five to 10 years and then we'll see uh, Burnett branded straight from the farm milk. <laughs> Maybe so. We'll see. <laughs> oh, great, great. And so, Brent, uh, or, uh, Reese, we've talked about the things that get you excited for the future and some of the tech that really is has been a game changer and that you know is going to be part of making the dairy successful in your position as you continue to develop as an owner and, and into management there. Um, but what's the other side? Like, you know, as a young, as a young dairyman, what worries you about the future of the industry? Um, you know, a lot worries me, Peggy. You know, like I said before, my goal is, my wife and I's goal is to have a business that's there for our kids when they're ready to come of age. And a lot of things have to happen right for that to uh, to come to be. So, um, yeah, and a lot of that's out of our control too, right? Whether the economy is going to remain viable whether my family is not going to run the business into the ground or not, you know. Um, but yeah, I, I think that uh, I think that we'll be okay. We'll keep working and keep our nose to the grindstone, and I would assume we'll achieve that goal. Yeah, absolutely. And environmental regulatory pressure, what does that look like in your area? Um, you know, it's not too bad. Um, I think a lot of that is because we don't have too many neighbors. But, you know, you would think that being in Wyoming, you know, a lot of people have watched the Yellowstone TV show. Oh, yes. <laughs> there's a lot more EPA than you would think being in Wyoming. You know, water's not terrible, actually. Um, so we are part of a small subsidiary of the Ogallala. And uh, it does recharge itself, but it can run out of water fairly early in the year. But um, so there's a creek nearby. And if the creek's running, then we're pretty good. But if the creeks dry for whatever reason, we can sure see it in our pivots. And so, yeah, I don't think there's a whole lot of opportunity for growth as far as more pivots. And so as we do look to expand the dairy, you know, that's one conversation we have. Say we want to double a milking herd size, whether we're going to do that at the same location and have to haul feed from, you know, twice or three times as far. Or if we're going to try running uh, dairy in two different locations. Ah, yeah. So those are some of the bigger picture conversations uh, in those forward thinking, <laughs> yep. forward thinking talks that you have with your dad and your uncle and family members. Yep. Right. Oh, Reese, I tell you, it is really fun to hear the excitement and enthusiasm coming from you as a young dairyman um, doing what you're doing. And I'm so, so grateful that you shared with that with us on the Up Level Dairy podcast. And this is the time in the podcast when we switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit more about you, about you. And this is the Up Level 5. So these are the five questions that are all about your personal um, next level of performance, what you're pushing for, you know, personally, professionally, as an individual. And so question number one I have for you today is this, what does success look like to you? Yeah. So my dad and I have used this quote ever since I was a little boy, that you're not rich until you have something that money can't buy. Ooh. And so what that means to me is that having a healthy relationship with God, my wife, and my kids someday is um is what it means to be successful all things you can't buy with money ah oh, your dad is a wise man isn't he he is <laughs> oh okay and then next question in three words how do you want to show up each day yes i, I want to show up confident humble and eager confident enough to push myself to be better but humble enough to know my own weaknesses 
and uh, eager to learn and better myself every day. Oh, wow. Well, uh, just in uh, this brief conversation that we've had, I would say that's how you showed up today, Reese. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> and uh, question number three, who are a couple of thought leaders or influencers that you follow? Um, yeah, first one is um, Jesus Christ in the Bible. Um, I know that God has a plan for me and wants me to uh, walk the straight and narrow. And then second one would be my dad. Um, he's been a very good example of what it looks like to be a Christian father, husband, and farmer. Yeah. Thank you for sharing your faith in that answer. That resonates with a lot of us out there. And, um, and you know, it's funny, Reese, like if I would have asked that question to other people your age, um, or if I would have asked it to my uh, eight-year-old, they would have said, Mr. Beast, uh, they would have... <laughs> <laughs> they would have named somebody on Instagram, <laughs> but, but you you are very well grounded in your faith, your family, and the farm, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, that's what it takes to be successful, I believe. Yeah, yeah, and so okay, I know you shared some really great quotes, but what are the words that you live by? Um, my whole family uses this one: "Average goes broke." <laughs> You know, we use that in the business, but that applies to our personal lives too, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And going off of that personal note, question number five, what is your next personal up level, the area of your life that you are looking to take to the next level? Yeah. So um, this is really exciting part in my life. My wife and I are expecting our first daughter in August. Oh, congratulations. Thank you very much. <laughs> so my next up level is being a good dad and continuing to be a good husband. Oh, well, Reese, you, uh, you will do fantastic. And it sounds like you have some excellent role models right, uh, right around you every single day. Doesn't matter if you're in the middle of nowhere, because you got about the best that you get to see between your dad and your uncle. And uh, those people that are influencing you and between your your faith and devotion to your family you're gonna be a great daddy <laughs> oh reese this has been so fun and um again thank you so much for joining us on the up level dairy podcast this episode is brought to you by dairy specialists dairy specialists is one of the leading and most innovative commercial dairy service and equipment dealerships in the country supplying commercial dairy farms with innovative parlor designs new construction remodels robotic milkers dairy waste management and 24 7 support and technical services their mission is to be the trusted and dependable advisors that dairy producers can count on to help bring their operational goals and vision to life find their contact information in our show notes Thank you for listening to the Up Level Dairy Podcast. I'm your host, Peggy Cawthien. And if you like what you heard today, go ahead and head on over to upleveldairy.com to read the blog and join the Up Level Dairy email list so you can receive new podcasts, blogs, and special offers coming soon from Up Level Dairy straight in your inbox. To listen to more episodes, head over to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube, and don't forget to rate and review. Connect with me, Peggy, at Peggy at UpLevelDairy.com, and follow Up Level Dairy on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn.